Oi oi people, Silky here, and you're listening to the Life Art Musician podcast. A podcast exploring the minds of creatives who've dedicated their lives to pursuing a career in music. The Life of Musician podcast is brought to you by Hookings Management, my artist services company that empowers our fellow DIY musicians to grow a monetized fan base without a record label. We offer a range of services such as online marketing, artist mentorship, release campaign management, videography, photography, graphic and website design, plus tons more useful services that are built to cater for independent musicians on small, self-funded budgets. Helping musicians market and monetize their art form is our passion. So if you're an artist that needs help taking your career to the next level, please feel free to reach out and get in touch via hookingsmanagement.com where you can book a video call with me for some free advice on your project. On today's episode, I'm joined by my friend and fellow DIY ska musician, Jet from the band Buster Shuffle. Buster Shuffle have been one of the hardest working live bands on the circuit since forming back in 2007. They've relentlessly toured around the globe, including shows supporting big names such as Madness, the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, the Interrupters and Flogging Molly, plus huge festival shows at Slam Dunk in the UK, punk rock bowling in the US and most recently a massive main stage slot at Punk Rock Holiday in Slovenia. The band have built a loyal fan base predominantly through grafting out on the road the old school way but have more recently also adopted some of the modern paid social ad methods to help expand their fan base drive more income for their DIY artist business. This is an area of which my company Hookings Management have had the pleasure in assisting Buster Shuffle in. So as well as talking about all the highs and lows of the band's impressive 16 year career, we'll also be talking about some of the marketing campaigns behind their recent releases and tours. If you're a DIY musician that wants to know what it takes to sustain a successful touring and merch business in this modern era, then this is the episode for you. So without further ado, let's get into it. Jet Buster Shuffle, Hello. welcome to the Life uh, Musician podcast, my friend. Thanks for coming on. No problem. So you formed a band in East London back in 2007. Um, what were the early days like? Do you think it took a while to build momentum or did you feel there was a buzz around the band right from the get-go? No, it took a long while to get anything going, to be honest, mate. Um, Mainly because we didn't know anyone in the music industry, we didn't have any contacts. It was like form a band because we want to play some gigs and that, yeah, get some gigs in some pubs in East London. That was our, that was our thing, and play as much as we can, and see if we can create a break or some magic out of that. Um, yeah, so many years ago in East London, me and Terry, our drummer. And uh, the original guitarist, Danny, decided that's what we'd do. We'd learn, learn some covers of bands that we liked, which are old 50s rock and roll music. That's what we were listening to. And then crossed over with a bit of Scar and went and played shows in, in pubs in East London. That was, that was how it started. So had you been in bands before that? Or was Buster Shuffle your first? Yeah, we'd all sort of done other indie projects, rock projects. Um, but we'd sort of hit a point where as musicians, we were probably doing, I reckon like 75% of our gigs were like bookings for doing covers in pubs or doing weddings and corporate stuff. Right. Where the money is. Yeah. Loads of young musicians go into that because it's easy money. And I think I was in my mid twenties and I was just like, I've got to stop. I can't just become like a, a wedding fucking piano player. Yeah. Um, for the rest of my time. And so, yeah, Bus Shuffle started, like I say, picking rock and roll covers that we wanted to play, the likes of Fats Domino, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, and then mixing it with some Scar stuff and just playing in pubs because we wanted to play for ourselves. Um, that was, yeah, that was like how we kicked off. So, like, how long was you gigging around London for before you started um, touring, like, beyond London? And, like, what were 
was there like a sort of what was do you feel like there you had a break at some point do you know what i mean where where the momentum started to build and yeah you know that led to like the release of the first album and everything what do you think sort of you know was the moment where it stopped uh it grew from like an amateur sort of unsigned band that was just going around grafting playing in the pubs to like one man and his dog and mm-hmm. i guess some nights were busy some nights weren't um, yeah, what was the sort of like, you know, the turning point? So I reckon we had two years of just pub gigs playing yeah. wherever we could. And we were getting quite a good name though because we were a good sort of laugh and a good party band. So we were getting invited back to really happening boozers in Hackney, like the Dolphin on Mare Street and Lower Clapton Road and Bethnal Green Workingmen's Club where where there was good nights happening mm. and good crowds that we were entertaining. But for two years, it was just playing these pubs and clubs in East London. And then sort of we created our own break or luck. There was a couple of jour- journalists that saw us that got into the band like what we're doing and then started to name drop us. And one of one of the early ones was in The Sun, in the biz. Do you remember the... Yeah. I don't know if it exists. And Gordon Smart, wasn't Gordon it? Gordon Smart. So yeah, one of yeah. his crew a, a girl a lovely girl called jenna good wrote about us in the sun like i know we're just saying keep on going to these amazing parties in east london watching buster shuffle and that was probably the break that sort of made us think okay we're we're getting on a you know a few people's radar although nothing came of it we didn't get a big record deal off the back mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so then was the first album self-released or yeah it, so right? what en- ended up happening was we did that east london thing and it built up a lot and our we recorded um a, de- a four track demo ep that we'd give out on burnt cds at the gig so everyone could walk walk away with a cd sort of promoting the name of the band and somehow that got passed on to a uh a and r guy Universal subsidiary of Universal called Fallout Records at Sandra Fratelli's. And do you remember the Rumble Strips? Yeah. So it's a subsidiary of Ireland like liked us and got in touch. So we started going in and demoing. And we were like, oh fuck, things are happening now. Island Records, shit, this is on, you know, and we like the Fratelli's. And um we were being demoed and having these meetings and uh they sort of orchestrate getting a manager and a booking agent. So people started through MySpace reaching out to us, which had never happened, saying, hi, I manage so-and-so, and I manage like Matt Claxon's manager, Frank Black from the Pixies, his manager. They're all getting in contact with us, which is incredible. Um, and we're like, and booking agents as well, which, you know, it's really, really hard to get a good booking agent. Um, but then that sort of big Napster phase happened where the music industry overnight sort of died. It seemed to die. And uh, that record label got shut. Everyone got fired. And <laughs> we were all on our, all on our lonesome with nothing. Um, and so we were getting excited about this buzz. And then we were back on on our asses, really. Mm, so you were then sort of forced to do the DIY thing and Again, self-release. Yeah. yeah. We sort of built, did the DIY thing, built it up. And, and then we're sort of flirting with the industry which was all new to us and uh then it all fell flat on its face um and the people that were dealing with like at ireland and stuff were literally jobless sort of like mm. can you help us like no no we're, we're getting new jobs we're done we're, we're we, you know we've been shut down yeah so that sort of east london guitar music scene like i remember it being you know buzzing but it did sort of like seemed to die out pretty abruptly yeah because you had the camden thing didn't you before that mm-hmm. uh, i mean camden's always been huge for like alternative guitar you know punk um you know it's always had a great scene there but east london was sort of buzzing wasn't it like oh yeah. six oh seven yeah oh eight um but yeah there was a lot of a lot of changes happening in the music business and you had that that sort of boom of guitar bands that sort of hit its pinnacle with Arctic Monkeys' first record, mm. I guess. Um, you know, that, like that it, sort of a couple of years after that first Arctic Monkeys record, because um, I was in a band around this time playing a similar circuit, mm. and it felt like 
yeah those opportunities like because we, we were being courted by labels and stuff for a while and I, I guess what I'm trying to say is is back then you could go to these gigs and there would be A&R people Industry. about that, yeah. that had messaged on MySpace prior to the show yeah. asking for guest lists and that like the industry were were about do you know what I mean and um and then it did all sort of seem to just disappear overnight didn't it yeah I mean it's certainly the size of it seemed it seemed to it shrunk and yeah the contacts we had sort of in in the labels and and uh it, well once this once fallout records has gone all the other interests because we were getting messages from parlophone and stuff it all just disappeared and mm. we were left high and dry and uh yeah and i think this sort of music in the east london at that time all the guitar stuff was really fashionable and then it goes out of fashion as quickly as it comes in yeah there's bands really good bands i remember like a do wop rock and roll band called Vincent Vincent and the Villains and they're all over Radio 2 and 6 Music and it's like oh my god this is going to happen for these guys they're doing four part harmonies boom disappeared just all these bands signed up disappearing signed up disappearing so it's pretty savage and we maybe on hindsight dodged a bullet because I know some bands that did sign deals at the same time as we were sort of looking at it or courting these uh, labels and uh, yeah they signed big deals and just nothing they didn't even get released yeah just like shelved and like yeah uh, but contractually tied in so they can't do that mm. so it gets, get signed up get excited some of them might even record the album and then be told there's not actually a space to s schedule a release yeah and they're like but we recorded the music again yeah, but there's no time frame because we've got our priority acts here and radio are going to be doing this and press going to be doing that there's no space for your music to be released mm -hmm. so we just shelve it mm. and then and actually grinding it out diy is the, is the better option out of the two isn't it well that, at least you've got control of your output do you know what i mean and that thing that you've put years and years of work into that's it making amazing gets to see the light of day in some capacity um, and through doing it DIY, you you do develop a lot of skills. Do you know what I mean? You become mm. by default you've got to be kind of entrepreneurial, haven't you? And 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 learn aspects of the business and stuff to execute that stuff. Um, you know. So so had you had you toured at that point at all? No, just literally <clears throat> we'd moved from the East London pubs into Candom, you know, the, yeah. the circuit of Barfly and. Dublin Castle and all those sort of places. Yeah. We hadn't done anything anywhere. Um, and when all of that sort of record uh, uh, label interest died, we had an album's worth of stuff that we had been writing and demoing. And um, we were like, well, no one's going to put it out for us. So we'll put it out on our, on our own. And that's the, like, I guess the early sort of yeah stages of, of of getting our of doing the proper diy thing on our own that all said <clears throat> we put it out through a um the manager at the time that we had he had like a dormant record label um and he sort of resurrected it for his distribution right because i mean when, when are we talking like late 2008 or 9 or 10 or something around that? i can't remember when our first record came out but it's really important to have distribution you couldn't market yourself like you can now mm -hmm. distribution getting it into the record shops and hopefully getting like h and v and people to buy it and then also with managers you could get good pr people yeah. which you relied massively on because you need press yeah and again you don't even really need that so much anymore but at the time even though we were diying it we recorded it on our own vocals and guitars and all the percussion was recorded at our house. We didn't have any budget for it. Yeah. The whole recording process was DIY. Um, we, yeah, we used a, uh, the manager at the time, his sort of redundant or like dormant record label to mm -hmm. actually get it released. Yeah. Which sort of meant a few copies might get put in H and V Oxford street. Yeah. Not a lot else. So, so how did it come about getting your first manager? Mm -hmm. Um, that was through the interest of the record label right. um, when we were playing the, the gigs in London. What, what was amazing was how much 
and I have very limited experience with like the music industry, the bigger industry is, but if you do get a way in and get interest and it's serious is that they are all talking to each other yeah. and that other, you know, an A&R guy is not going to be able to sign you on his own. He needs to sign it off to his boss. He, his boss will go, who else is interested in these guys? Yeah. And if he's like, well, absolutely no one, just me, I'm going on a hunch. He's fucked. He's not going to get anything. So he has to get a good manager put in place, a good booking agent. And he will literally have his contacts and go, I've got a band I like. If you get behind it and you get behind it, mm -hmm. then there's a group of us behind it. Then I get the authority to sign it. And it was like, this is just a cartel. Yeah. Or, or a mate's club. Mm. And, and, and then as well stimulate interest from other record labels so he's getting off you know he can put in an offer because he goes well if we don't Parlophone have reached out and so and so have reached out and V2 have reached out so it's sort of created all this interest mm. and then but when that part the important part imploded which is the label then all of it dissipated pretty quickly mm. except for the manager yeah, so he stuck with you. Yeah, and I think I think he did it. He's a nice guy, and he felt sorry for us. Mm. But I suppose his model would usually be he'd have a network of kind of A and R people that he could go and pitch to, mm -hmm. and, and booking agents as well. Yeah, and and I guess you know two years prior to this, maybe it wasn't uncommon for a band to be chucked a hundred grand advance by like Sony or whoever and that manager is straight away you know getting 15 or 20 percent of yeah. that do you know what I mean within yeah. a few months of signing you so the financial incentive is there yeah um but that's changed isn't it you know I feel like where you, there's not like nearly as many record deals around nowadays um <clears throat> for someone to, to to manage a band full time they've really just got to work it from the ground up with the artist, you know what I mean? And help that artist turn the, turn the, their artist business into this self-sufficient profitable thing. Now, mm -hmm. like that's the, that's the sort of task of the modern manager yeah. more than it is getting a record deal these days. Obviously record deals still, still happen. Do you know what I mean? And that is certainly a model that's still very much happening, mm -hmm. but I think um, what's changed like in the modern era compared to then is is, is very much that like managers, um, you know, will often won't even be thinking about a record deal. Do you know what I mean? They'll just be helping the artist secure some kind of funding um, or, or, you know, maybe perhaps just help them navigate, invest in their own money do you know what i mean reinvesting what they've earned yeah. from gigs or whatever and just helping them build to the point where they're a profitable artist business and then perhaps go and tout it to labels yeah. um or maybe yeah. not maybe they just keep growing it diy but that was yeah you releasing your record diy back then mm. wasn't really like the norm at all was it it, it wasn't <clears throat> and uh and it would be it's very easy all the work an effort and love and the you know uh, care that we put into it just to release it and just go poof, disappear because you can't compete excuse me with any of the big boys anyway you know you've got no budget to sort of pay pluggers and, yeah and the, all the you know to get on the radio and things so but we were really lucky in that we are we through sort of the gigs in London, we had this amazing press girl who liked us and uh, worked for quite a decent press uh, um, agent. Uh, she was part of a bigger sort of group. Uh, do do our press for this DIY record. And she pulled some really big bits out of, like, out of nowhere, mm -hmm. um, Uncut, which is sort of a reputable yeah. mag, four, four out of five star Uncut review. She got us in quite a few newspapers. Guardian supported it, didn't Guardian they? got yeah. behind it. Or he kind of said it was all right if you, yeah, Guardian, it was, yeah. But we were, at the end of the day, it's sort of, it's a weird thing back then as well. It was like, it doesn't matter if they're calling you, if they're saying it's shit, it's just to get them to talk about you. Yeah. And even the point you used to think like, I remember chatting going, do you think the enemy will acknowledge what we're doing? And the guitarist going, it doesn't, even if they don't and they call us 
like saying it's just pub shit. Yeah. What a load of old bollocks. The fact that they're slagging us off is a good thing. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad the industry's not like that, that you don't, I don't give a, f no one fucking cares what those. Yeah, it was Dick's pretty... right or think. They never mentioned our name once. Yeah. But that was our thinking. It's like, even if they're going to like slag us off, it's great they're talking about us. But anyway, I'll digress a bit. The press girl did get us some good juicy bits of press that sort of put got us out there a bit. Um, it didn't sell loads of records or anything, but mm -hmm. it was part of the sort of the game, getting press. We got a bit of Radio 2, Steve Lamack, and a few spot plays. I remember thinking the first time Radio 1 played us, that's it. Next show in London is going to be sold out. There's yeah. no, no difference at all. No, you, yeah. In see, I had that in states of emotion. We had we were hottest record in the world on Hugh Stevens Radio One show. It didn't really make a blind bit of difference no. to like ticket sales or anything like that. I think that um, what I've sort of learned from um, using services like that for both Death of Guitar Pop. We tried that sort of in the early days of Def Guitar Pop and we tried it quite a bit in my old band. Um, and then also like now I've been doing like these paid social ads for like six, seven years or whatever. I think the difference is, is like that traditional style of marketing where you're hiring like a press agent, a radio plugger, perhaps something like that. <laughs> What that gives you is like as a DIY musician who's on a budget paying for those services, not being able to bankroll necessarily like a year's worth of like radio plugging, mm. like at, at the top tier. Do you know it's what I mean? Expensive. It's expensive. It's very expensive. And and I think if DIY musicians are, um, you know, spending a few grand on those services, what they're getting from that is actually content. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and, and as you say, like back then, like getting the Guardian and Uncar and spot plays from Le Mac, it, it kind of just like what it does is it puts authority on like your brand as an artist yeah. and validates what you're doing. Yeah. So the people that are interested or half interested are like fucking hell, yeah, this is happening. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And and so it kind of like um, you know it it, it reaffirms um or further validates that thing you've got with your audience and the people that are like interested in what you're doing but it doesn't really translate to like loads of genuine fan conversions no. um so i've started to view that 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 whole thing i've only really just like figured that out after all these years do you know what i mean because mm. well, as soon as paid social ads were working for me and you're literally seeing like someone's seen an ad that day and then they're buying a cd it's like fuck that is like that person's stopped scrolling they've watched my music video for three and a half minutes i've replied to a comment offering them a, a free yeah. plus shipping album where they pay the postage on the cd and they've bought it like, mm. like that to me is like the sort of purest form of Mu music marketing other than like you know playing live like supporting Absolutely. or at festivals or whatever to new to new fans um and i and it, and it kind of like i was already a bit cynical towards traditional like press and radios and that from my experience with my old band where we had paid out we had some results of it but I didn't really see the fan conversion um and then as soon as the ads were working in this new band i was like well, yeah, this is the answer. Like, this is where you get your return. But now I can actually see that that paying for radio plug-in and press and things like that, um, it is. If you've, I believe, if you've got that extra budget, like beyond like building the fan base through the ads and the social content, um, it is worthwhile if they are getting those things for you. Like you said, the Steve Lamac play, yeah. the Uncut, the Radio One spot play, or whatever, because it creates content and and and, yeah. and buzz and it and it validates sort of, the yeah it validates the the artist brand but um i think where we've probably all been guilty of going wrong at times as diy musicians that have been having a go for a long time and pushing and trying all these different methods through self-releasing is we're expecting it to to give us a break at radio so that then leads to daytime playlisting yeah. and or, you know rather than just like a, a good review in kerrang you know, you, you progress from that and you end up having like a feature or a front cover or something like that. And I think when you're on a, 
I think th those things are quite competitive anyway, even even at the top level for artists that have got mm. the big machine behind them financially and network wise. Um, but for DIY musicians that have just, you know, doing a couple of grand here and there across an album campaign, um, yeah, you, your money will burn quickly. It, it, yeah, it's a very hard, it's very hard to financially sustain that. And it's very disappointing when you realize yeah. it doesn't kind of like, you know, give you that break as an artist and, and bring in all those new fans. Because I know bands that have paid thousands for press, you know, and radio for albums and singles and they don't get anything. Mm. That's the thing. We got stuff. There's yeah. other bands I know that were paying thousands. Well, we had that with Definitely Guitar Pop. Anything. Yeah. And the, the first, so, one of the sorry, first. No one likes it. Yeah. Um, but we punted it to uh, so and so and so and so and so. So we did this, right? And so you still got to pay us. Yeah. Yeah. At least with job. the at least with the ads, if an ad's not converting and you're spending like ten quid a day, you can just hit just the brakes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tweak it. So you've always had a really strong touring presence throughout Europe, particularly in Germany. Uh, is it fair to say that Germany is where your biggest fan base is? And how did the European touring all come about in the first place? Yeah, I'd say that's fair, fair to say that that's probably our biggest market. Um, and that came about because when, well, I'm not entirely sure how that came about, but when we eventually put out our DIY album that we recorded um, first time round through our old manager the album came out we got some good press and we were like right let's go because we had a booking agent book us some fucking gigs we're ready we've been playing pubs for years tight we're hungry and nothing more tumbleweed it's just like oh come on fucking hell we're in the we've got some press we've got some radio play good to go and the booking agent at the time i won't say who it was but it was a classic sort of like you know booking really well-known established bands that you would think they could then sort of get you in on the, on the coattails of these bigger bands. None of it. And they were literally going like a whole summer come, came and went and we're like, we haven't had, I think we had one festival offer, which we played in the, the VIP bar to the punters. It, we weren't even on a stage at a festival. It was just like, we we're the background music. It was like, that was our summer's uh, festivals. But they said, we keep on getting an offer for a couple of shows in East Germany uh, from some German band we've never heard of. And that was sort of our sort of like, okay, well, we've got nothing in England. Why don't we go to Germany? So we checked this band out and sang in German. We didn't know anything of them. But we're like, well, a gig's a gig, man. So get yeah. in the band. Drive to Berlin. Um, and were they a ska band? No, like a German punk rock band. But turns out the lead singer is a massive ska fan and reads like English press. And probably, we don't know, but they, their management label, they're really big, big German band. Now got even bigger. And they were all sort of claiming dibs on how they had heard of Buster Shuffle, but it, right. it seems that... What's the of, name of the band? Uh, Broilers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Royalers, big sort of rock and ring headlining mm -hmm. band, but um, lovely guys too. But they uh, so it's there they got in touch with you, like they got in touch with their agent. agent, got in touch with our agent because and the lead band that had like Sammy had read Uncut, wicked, and I think the quote in Uncut in the review, it's a tiny little review, was like the two tone revolution starts here, <laughs> and uh, Sammy was like, right, let's get Buster Shuffle out. So that was. We, and we did that tour and then we kept on getting invites to go and play in Germany. So off the back of that tour, how many dates did you do with them? I think 10. So that was your first like European, or your first German run was 10 dates. Yeah, they had those. like nightliners, trucks, rigging, crew. We turned up in a van with a trailer and one bloke to sell our t-shirts was your main support yeah wicked and they were like where is all your crew where is your nightliner because <laughs> i think they'd read the the press and they, just presumed that they you thought were we like were a bigger happening. entity they, yeah they yeah didn't realize that we were you know just this was our first first gig, rodeo first rodeo out out there so so that tour then 
of, of 10 dates. I mean, what sort of, like, what size venues were you doing? They were, I think the smallest was um, about eight or 900, and I think the biggest they did was 4,000. And that was a big homecoming show for them, the 4,000. Now they're up to, like, 20 to 30,000 and all. Wow. So they've, they've become one of the biggest rock bands in Germany. Yeah. Um, but that was an opening for us and got us in front of other promoters and stuff. But even off the back of that, when we decided we'd go back out to Germany, like a few months later, we were playing in cities like Bremen where we had played with supporting this band to like 3,000 people. And we had about 12 people at this bar. Really? And the, the promoter was like, I didn't bother putting your posters up because ticket sales are so lousy and all this. And we're like, Shit. it was like, we've driven so far and you don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Please, somebody start giving a fuck somewhere. But that's sort of, they don't. Um, a lot of people don't. And, and so well, it was like the support tour that you did and then this first like little club tour that you got booked off the back mm. of that. Yeah. Was that all running at a loss? Was it all a loss leader? Everything, losing lots of money. You literally just work in your day job, whatever that was, to lose money doing your band. Yeah, but I mean, it's you, you can't, you shouldn't really, when you're young enough to do it, just fucking do it. Have a go, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. We had some brilliant times and uh, great gigs, and then just by getting out there and giving it a go, um, things sort of doors open, I think. And then through one contact in Germany to another, we got a record deal over in Germany. And that sort of then really cemented us into that sort of German market. Was that like a license deal for Our Night Out? Yeah. Was that the next record? So it was the album we recorded on our own. They licensed it and released it in Germany. It's a subsidiary of EMI. And uh, that, I mean, that got us going over there. So got that us. was a bit of a turning point, basically, like sort of roughing it out, doing it. Oh, I mean, I can imagine the Broilers tour was sick, to be fair, like mm. playing to those crowds every mm. night. But... Then going to do your club shows, your first headline club dates would have been humbling, I'll imagine, like, yeah. you know, um, and, and fucking like mentally tough, like losing all that money and playing to 12 people yeah. some nights or whatever. But through sticking it out, uh, the opportunity of a record deal in Germany did yeah. arise. And that's yeah. now led to this wicked fan base that you've got out there and this regular sort of program of gigs that you're doing every year. Yeah. I think there's a lot we we still had to work hard and there was very little money involved and we sold um, we signed bad record deals really that gave away all our rights for very little money stupid but then you can own 100% of nothing or you you know 100% of nothing is guaranteed failure um, if it's like you have all the ownership but no one's working it mm. so you have to give them yeah. big fat chunk yeah even though the advances and stuff weren't very good they were bad mm -hmm. but they put the music out there and worked it in a territory and those advances did you just use them to fund the next tours and stuff just that? record records yeah, yeah. It, there wasn't even video budget so and then fun tours yeah just yeah just put it all back in straight back in straight back in didn't get paid for years so years where, and years and years. Everything. What would you say, like four or five years out there before you started getting like decent fees for festivals and like your, your club shows? Yeah, maybe four or five, maybe longer. It's just weird. It's sort of like you, you initially there's a bit of a buzz and there were some great sold out shows. And then, then we were this quirky ska band from London. And then that, once that had, sort of worn out by album two because we signed a free album deal by the third album they're like yeah we, we're all used to that mm -hmm. so then you've got to build it back up because a lot of the first wave of fans were there for the buzz and the hype. yeah and then they don't stick they didn't stick with us and some did but then it was like rebuilding it so it feels like there's been loads of phases mm -hmm. but we have a great fan base in in germany particularly but like austria and Switzerland and mainland Europe, we can go out and Czech Republic, go to cities and play really cool shows, which is great. Yeah, so having that core base of super fans has sort of been like integral to yeah. like the longevity of it all. Yeah, supporting us, get, you know, just coming to every show and yeah. buying 
all our merch and things. So that really helps. But like after what, 10 years of doing that, maybe longer, it's sort of like we realized a few years ago with ne neglected England. Mm -hmm. That was because our record deal with the subsidiary of EMI in Germany treated Germany as a home territory. So it was like, this will be your, like where we work you the most. Yeah. And we will work you in England. And we were like, that's a bit weird, but like, I don't care because no one's interested in England. It's just a big, nasty music industry of like, mm. if you're current or trendy, whereas out in Germany, it just seems to like you if you rock. Yeah. <laughs> give it yeah. some, give it some welly and they'd be into it. So and I suppose like, <laughs> you know, them romanticizing a bit about our like pop culture, our, our kind of subcultures, yeah. like two tone and that is what, what got you, your ticket out there. Do you know what I mean? And, and while they've always, perhaps appreciated it um, yeah. a bit more. Um, so so the band's currently self-managed and self-releasing, um, but you've got both a UK and a Europe booking agent. Yeah. How integral do you think working with your booking agents has been? Um, in Europe, massive, really, because they, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Over time, I feel like we could put on our own show, for example, in big cities like Berlin or Hamburg if we wanted to, or maybe Czech Republic and Prague and stuff. But it's they're sort of taps into the matrix. And so, yeah, they it's all very well going, I can book a gig in Berlin, but then if my next show and my only other contacts in, I don't know, Paris and then one back in Vienna, you just like... It's so vast. You yeah. gotta have someone who can route your tour, get good availability for club shows. So it's for me having a good booking agent. We're really lucky. We have got over there is is really important and great because also, you know, they know there's a lot of festivals in Europe that are really regional, like like in Bavaria and stuff. They'll have these. Uh, state funded festivals they'll, and they'll pay well for bands to come out there um, and they'll program a load of like international acts um, but it'll be a small festival in a town in Bavaria still have a few thousand people there mm -hmm. all, that, all all of which you can convert into fans but like an agent in London just wouldn't be aware of it mm. they just sort of tap or a UK agent will know the big festivals that they want to get in Germany, Hurricane, Download, uh, not Download, um, Rock and Ring, Rock and Park. Park. Yeah, yeah. So having a local promoter in a territory, uh, uh, booking agent's really good. Yeah, yes, uh, local knowledge is, is really important. Yeah, being able to speak the language, know how, know who's working with who. A lot of those guys, when they do own festivals, own a bit of each other's festivals. Yeah. There's lots of trading going on. Yeah, nice little network to tap into. So if yeah. you're good with one, you'll get the other one. You might get that one because they're all sort of working together. And has there been a few times like, so this summer you've done quite a few massive ones uh, in Europe. Has there been a few where you've literally just gone out there for like a weekend just to play the one show because it's been that mm. worthwhile and yeah. uh, agent hasn't managed to get dates around it or anything? Yeah. Which... So a lot of bands sort of come out and they spend the whole, like in Europe is can be lucrative if you can put in the effort to get over there. There's loads of American bands spend their whole summers in Europe. Yeah. They just come over for eight weeks. Some of them are big and they'll have like hotels and nightliners and some of them are not getting, they're unknown, but they'll just do it. Yeah. Sort of trying to you know, have a go at it and, and, and might get lucky. So there's a lot of, competition a lot of bands touring um but we've sort of been going in and out a bit more this year although we had like a 10 date run just a few weeks ago but yeah we get a good festival off i fly in play the show fly out mm -hmm. but we've got a bit of an infrastructure in europe now like a backline and van and stuff we can leave it there oh really yeah and have you got helps. like someone that like stores your merch and that out there have you got separate got, merch for yeah but germany and stuff we've, we've got sort of yeah, just places where we can store merch, store gear, leave a van so the this, this splitter so we can, so you're not having to cross through Calais all the time. It's a bit of a ball lake if you're doing that weekend after weekend just to play mm -hmm. festivals. So we kind of leave it 
leave the van at Cologne or, or Hamburg or Nuremberg, an airport, have it all locked up and secure and then just fly and fly out, which has been really good because it means you can say yes to lots of festivals but not be driving like thousands of miles mm. just to get there. Yeah. Because trust me, driving back from like Vienna is a... Because you do all the drives as well, don't you? Well, you can't, once you're in Europe, you kind of have to. And yeah, but I mean, like actually it's you that's doing the driving, isn't it, out of the, the crew? The band, there's three of us drive. Oh, you share it, dear? Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Right, right. I, I'm, a, I like, I'm a bit of a road dog. Yeah. I, like a, I like to drive, see the scenery go past, but yeah. no, nah, I couldn't do... Couldn't do the old thing. <laughs> no. Nah. I, I mean, there was a time I might have given it a go, and I've done some pretty epic drives personally, but you got to split that. Yeah. Because, you know, just on that last run, there was one Berlin to Slovenia, Punk World Holidays, was 14 hours of straight driving. It's a oh, lot man. of driving. Do you often as well, like, come off stage, jump down and do the merch thing, the meet and greet, and then drive through the night? Yeah, try to. I always try to get on the merch. That's really important. Because yeah. sometimes after a festival, especially, you might go to the merch desk, and have a chat with um, whoever's selling our merch and they'll go, yeah, it's all right. And if you hang around a bit, then people start to come over and want to Yeah, I think it, it makes so much difference, doesn't it? The to presence. go down and, you know, thank everybody and, and make the time to, to have photos and sign mm -hmm. stuff and that. Fans really appreciate it and it works out well for you as an artist because people come over to the merch more and check it out because yeah. you're there. Yeah. So, but yeah, were well, you often like, so you drive like this epic drive to get to the show, perform, which is fucking just exhausting, isn't yeah. it? And then and then go and do the meet and greet for yeah. an hour, and then like drive another three or four hours, like some Sometimes. shows. A yeah. lot of the time, I mean, if you can, like with your own tools, you you have hotels and you sleep. Yeah, but we will always try to take the sleep. Yeah. Um. After the gig, even if it's like, I mean, sometimes we're in a hotel for three hours, and it's such a. It's always a nice hotel as well when you've got no time in it. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a day off, it's always in the like grotty. Yeah, one. yeah. But um, always try and get a bit of rest, um, and then on on to the next gig, next city. But sometimes there's literally not enough time to be able to go to the hotel. Mm. So you will literally turn up four or five hours before a festival. You know, crew, everyone will get be getting it set up. You play, like you say, then you go down to the merch, then everyone's packing down, you go to the merch to sell a bit, get in the van, drive, turn up to the next festival, especially if you're on, you know, mid afternoon or something, there's not yeah, it's just not you can't risk missing the gig, mm. cancelling the uh not not playing a show's not cool if just because you've fucking overslept time. yeah it's a fucking disaster that and it yeah it, and, and it can and that can fuck all your profit for the whole tour yeah because and you know you're not gonna you're not gonna get booked for many more i mean vans break down and things happen that are unavoidable but yeah if it's literally like we wanted to go back to our hotel and sleep for a bit mm. you've got to do your planning and you know get know what you've got to do mm -hmm. especially if you're self sort of managing and doing the, the sort of um the tour management the tour side management yourself, yourself. Yeah. you gotta know that shit because there's a few times i tend to do it with our band because we've all been at it for a long time so everyone's pretty cool it's like boys looking at the map tomorrow i think we should be getting off then and everyone's down with it but you you don't want to be sort of arguing and then missing shows and mm. or getting we've, we've come close have you ever missed one we've come really close oh, yeah. and it was a yeah. massive festival in germany and they shut the autobahn and we were stuck it luckily we had allowed loads of time but we, there was a big argument about fucking just getting there an hour before we play and the people who wanted to get there four hours before won and then we got stuck in on the autobahn for hours and hours and we literally loaded on to the stage as the other band were coming off we pulled it into the fucking festival hell man that was so stressful the, yeah, it, was <laughs> it was set up line check go and i was like well we would have completely missed this if we had um 
not allowed to. I mind. bet, like, when you got to that last song, like, the relief, like, must have just been such a, like, lovely feeling, like, just washing over. You know when, like, the gig's in the bag, yes. you know what I mean? You're halfway through the last song, yes. and you're like, fucking hell, yeah. We've, we've and we've been told it. the festival's sponsored by Jaeger as well. So there was, like, a Jaeger bar in the <laughs> Ready to go, bit. yeah, and yeah. Like, yeah. Everyone was just, <laughs> like, fucking banging that Jaeger. I mean, it's pretty, yeah, pretty gnarly drink, but that was... Uh, a lot of drunk band members that night. Oi, oi, people. Silky here. I hope you're enjoying the episode. I just wanted to take a short break to tell you about a fantastic mastering service I recently used for my band Death of Guitar Pops forthcoming album, Be Lucky. Jake from Decent Mastering was a joy to work with from start to finish, and we're so happy with how the final masters of our songs are sounding. Jake is currently offering an incredibly fair pay-what-you-want mastering service to all independent musicians. So if you're an unsigned artist that's on a budget, be sure to hit up Jake for a great service at an affordable rate. Check out decentmastering.com for more info. Now, let's get back to the podcast. Throughout your career, you've you've worked with a few different indie labels and distributors. Mm -hmm. um, but for your most recent album release, Go Steady, you decided to self-release through a crowdfunding campaign. Yep. How would you say is that compared to working with a record label? Like, What are the pros and cons of that? Um, it's, for me... It's been great. It's been a real eye opener. Obviously, I mean, I reached out to you. That's what we're here to chat about and hookings to uh, to because I'd obviously seen your band and the name pop up a lot and watch it grow. Not as a fan, but just as like a geezer in the scene in yeah. another band. But it's like sort of going up, um, gaining momentum in that. So I reached out to you um, with our last record just to see if there's you know something we could do, and yeah, we crowdfunded it. Used your sort of uh, well, what you're offering, hookings, guidance, and sort of expertise, and threw in our own things as well. And personally speaking, very like it's been great. It's like we sold more pre-sale than we have with any of our other. Uh, releases when we were signed to good labels, um, even though they were small labels, but we did more pre-sale. I think our overall sales were bigger than we've ever had. Um, you know, you could argue that last record we put out was coming out of lockdown and lots of people might have been in the mindset of buying shit because yep. they hadn't been able to do anything or mm -hmm. go anywhere. They're just like, fucking buy, buy, you know, pre-order the album. Yeah. It's nice to have the control. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really, it's it's a new way of thinking for me because I come from the time when we it was sort of all the things we've discussed. It's sort of like you're capping on to the fucking A&R guy or capping on to the booking agent or capping on to the PR person. Please get me on the, the plugger, get me on the radio. And, and actually now there is a uh, a way to reach people and you can do it yourself. It's mm. fucking liberating, really. Mm. And, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, re I'm, I'm probably c converted now, I, I think I'm converted. I think that is the modern way now, though. Do you know what I mean? I feel like um, a few years ago when these ads were first working for me and then I started helping other bands implement the same methods um for their artist career i was sort of wondering is this gonna is this a bubble that's gonna burst like myspace for instance yes myspace was awesome do you yes. know what i mean that was yeah. sort of the original version of this yeah, and yeah. it did it took the power away from the gatekeepers for the first time do you know what i mean there was this route where you could like put your music out there um diy and there was a network of gen a social network of like genuine genuine organic music fans there wanting to discover new music. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, obviously it disappeared like, you know, overnight almost. Mm. Um, and I was, when, when I was first doing this as a business and everything, that was one of my initial fears starting up. Like what if the fucking Facebook ads manager just goes to shit, do you know what I mean? Or if it stops working mm. or if that social platform stops and that, but I just think, 
you know the well, one I don't think the you know the 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 the, the main platforms like the the meta owned ones and YouTube and that they're not going anywhere. But I actually just think the fundamentals of you know modern marketing like you know that they're they're set in stone now do you know what i mean and yeah i think that like as as um i think more and more artists will become entrepreneurs like mark marketers as a result do you know what i mean because you kind of have to like learn so much of this stuff whether you want a record deal or not do you know what i mean like you still you look at a band like Sleaford Mods, for example, that are signed to uh, Rough Trade, mm. they built a huge thing DIY first yeah. with their manager. Yeah. Like their manager, have you seen a documentary? No. A bunch of cunts, it's called. It's fucking great. Um, he was <laughs> got this little boutique label. Um, he's Gaff in um, Nottingham, I think. And, and he's literally, you, you, like, they're filming his lounge and there's just stacks of vinyl that he's, that he's shipping out, like... Mm. Um, you know, and they were doing your rock cities and similar sized venues all around the UK before they, they signed with Rough Trade. Yeah, nice. And that they're kind of like a prime example of like you still and Idols is another one, do you know? What I mean, I think they sold like over ten thousand copies of Brutalism um before they signed to Partisan Records, you know. Mm-hmm. That is becoming pretty commonplace now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Bands, I and they, they were a business. Like, whether they kind of set out to be a business or not, um, they built a really successful business before they then jumped into bed with the labels that then helped them take it to the next level. Um, but, yeah, I think whether you're, whether you're like, sort of fucking DIY to like die mentality, don't want to sign to a label, or you like the idea of yeah. signing to... Um, you know, one of those great record labels like a Rough Trade or someone like that. Either way, you've got to, you've got to roll up your sleeves and and graft it and hustle. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I, f- I think to even get the interest, I mean, I'm out of touch, but of any decent established label, they probably need to see that you've done x amount on your own and that you've yeah. got the fucking desire. They don't want to throw money at you if they think you're not serious about it. Yeah, not unless you. Well, they can't take the risks anymore, no. can they? And not unless you're like a surefire fucking 360 deal bet where, you know, you, your uncle's the head of A&R or something like that, where yeah. it's like a that like family nepotism. Yeah. Bit, but it's rife throughout the industry. I've got uh. so-and-so, my dad's in that band or, you know, that's that shit. It's always going to carry some acts on. But if they're throwing big money at you, they need to know that you've, you know, put in the groundwork and that you're serious about it. And mm. bands that have sold 10,000 units off their back, off their own back, are, are serious entities, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely, man. And I, I just think that that's, that's the modern way now. It's it's learning how to market yourself on social media and mm. book your own tours and everything. I mean, that's the booking your own tours thing has always been a bit of a thing anyway. But obviously social media really helps you know, is is kind of the engine behind those ticket mm. sales. Um, the the thing for me, just to like, we spent that really sort of like changed my mind or made me sort of have an awakening. Or what was needed was like, <clears throat> we've got like twenty thousand legitimate followers on Facebook. We've been building since Facebook band sort of pages became a thing and they're like that's crisscrossing all over the world europe america fans in england gigging our asses off we're posting like tour information or information about a new seven inch and not reaching anyone and then it was that chat i think with you or it's a chat we've definitely had of like Facebook and Instagram, now you have to pay them to access your own fans. So all those fans are legit. And that's when, as a dinosaur, me being the dinosaur, I realised, fuck, this this has shifted a lot now. Yeah. You have to. So these paid ads, I was like, oh, God, I don't want to fucking... People are going to get really pissed off seeing our, our mugs in their feed and stuff, but you actually, to access your own fan base have to pay these yeah. companies yeah now i don't really like that and whether anyone else likes it or not 
doesn't matter because that's the fucking game. Mm. So you've got to pay Facebook to reach your own fan base. But of course, there's opportunities now with that to pay Facebook or Meta, sorry, Instagram, those those social like channels. You pay them to then reach other fans that aren't your fans. But the, to, the fact yeah. that we had to, you have to part money to reach your own fan base is mental. But that's the game. It, yeah, and if it you're not, does, it seems harsh. But with what you guys have built, like what was so enticing about working with you guys, other than being like a massive fan of the music, was I was fully aware of like, you know, what you'd achieved as a band, um, you know, and your sort of touring pedigree and everything um, and your back catalogue. So for me, it was really exciting because at that point, I'd only really worked with artists from the ground up. Yeah. Whereas like you were already a few records in, you'd mm. done some massive tours. Um, you know, there was a fan base there and I'd, I'd been like sort of waiting for a client to come along um, that already had a bit of an audience. Cause yeah. I, I could see that I think, you know, artists are kind of wising up to it now. And if you're not utilizing this stuff, you're probably well behind, but whenever it was two and a half or years ago, mm. uh, when, when you first reached out, I could see it all the time, like, uh, you know, artists just not, like, tapping into their core yeah. fan base through these ads the way that we were and, like, maximising the monetization of mm. that. Um, so that was what was exciting. It was like I could see that, yeah, like 20,000 Facebook followers, 10,000 Instagram followers and, you know, this touring history and um, a bit of a mailing list, like, there's there's a – customer base there do you know what mm. i mean that would really get behind the crowd and we couldn't campaign. reach it yeah we couldn't reach our own fans which was mental yeah that's it man it's, well mental to me and yeah and i remember like sitting in this office with you and brad that first day we had um putting the sort of you know the marketing plan together for go steady and like um going through your just collecting your data from all these different mm. places. So there was like one site where you'd been selling tickets through. There was like an mm. online store. Was mm. it Big Cartel you was using then? Mm, the Big Cartel Square and then Space. Squarespace. Squarespace. Yeah, it was a f just a few different like platforms. Mm. Um, you know, and I was explaining like the SMS marketing to you, the, yeah. the click send, um, which actually I think that and it, artists still aren't really – um, aware of how effective sending texts out to mm. your customers um, can be. Mm. And I remember like we we sort of like downloaded all these CSVs and it was like, fucking hell, I've got like, you know, a few hundred phone numbers here. It might have been over a thousand, mm. like, um, you know, and, and, and yeah, we did these retargeting campaigns to the warm audience. So the people that pre-engaged, uh, in the past 365 mm. days on Facebook and Instagram. And although you were having to pay to reach your audience, which does seem fucking, you know, a bit um, backward, mm. you, you know, what, what you're, it, it, to, to kind of reach a core warm audience of say like 20,000 people across a month, like 10 pounds a day is probably going to hit all those yeah. people enough times. And, you know, that crowdfunding campaign quickly generated like 20 plus grand, wasn't yeah. it? You know, in I mean, sales. Did 10 grand in a few days. Yeah, which, 10 grand in the first few days. Yeah. Which is just unlocking our own fans on Facebook and yeah. actually reaching them. Yeah. With a few, you know, videos of me saying we're putting out a record on our own, get behind it. Yeah, like man. Video, video message type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Paid, yeah, I think 10, 15 pound a day and. And it reached people. Mm. It reached our own fans. Yeah. And, I, and, and I, they engaged and they went and that's like, I think we hit 20, I mean, yeah, previous albums, I think like our pre-sale was normally like four or 5,000 pounds maybe. And then on that one, we did 25 grand. And is that four or 5,000 pounds? Is that like gross overall? Is that your cut? That, that was just our pre-sale. So like the label would put pre-sale on in Germany. Yeah. And there'd be other, dis like certain shops would have like a blue run of vinyl or some would have green. So you do all these different variations and they would obviously all have their own pre-orders. Uh, but from the band, we, from our perspective, when we're like, we're 
selling signed copies in orange vinyl. And you can only buy them from the band. So if you want to support us, a lot of people like to buy their records in, on the continent through their record shop. They want to support their local vinyl like yeah. store in Dusseldorf. Mm -hmm. So like I had friends over there and fans are saying, yeah, we won't buy from you. We'll only buy for a record shop. That's why it's important to have distribution and stuff in Europe to, yeah. to reach those people. That all said and done, our free, uh, our target was about, uh, not target, our previous sales were about three or four grand, I think, max. That was, we were with uh, Burning Heart, I think we did, which was the Hives label, great label for our fourth album. Four grand of pre-sale ourselves as a band. They're all thereabouts. Yeah. The label did a load of pre-sale, distributors bought it, Shop, um, shops and, you know, online and uh, uh, like Amazon stuff bought copies or whatever. So yeah, our pre-sale though has never been anywhere near as high as what we did on that last record. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of, yeah, I mean, actually you give it a go and that changed sort of my mind or just like opened my eyes a bit. I thought, why not try it? So I, I, I still almost don't believe it. I think it, it might have been the lockdown effects, but then you know, we did 25 grand, so hopefully we can do it again in a bit yeah. more. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty certain you'll do more next time. Um, and just, just, sorry, to have that money in your bank account. Well, that's huge, isn't it? It's uh, suddenly, And the data as well, getting the data for every single yeah, sale. So it's yeah. not like, that. you know, that. Yeah. I mean, obviously you've got a few in record shops, as you say, but it's not like the labels selling it from a few different, like, online like sites or whatever and they're keeping the email addresses and phone numbers like you, you're getting and postal addresses and yeah. that you're getting all that customer you data reach those guys the next ep t-shirt runs whatever yeah yeah and it was the same as well with your um like london show and all wasn't it because you'd played the hundred club yep with a promoter and it was a, a pretty decent gig when it was fresh off of lockdown so everyone was struggling a bit ticket wise but you still did good yeah, numbers good good few hundred in there but i remember you saying that um you know financially it weren't great uh, and you got to wait for the payout as well whereas like um fast forward the clock you self-promoted the underworld mm -hmm. um, and we helped you set up the ticketing on shopify and yeah. helped you run the ads and like with what you've just mentioned with the album campaign the great thing about that is is you're getting um you're getting all the ticket money in like real time do you know what i mean um it's absolutely and all yeah. reporting in real time do you know what i mean you've literally got an app on your phone and you know you can check how many tickets you've sold 24 7 and any ticket that gets sold apart from like the venue will want to take a small allocation with whoever they've got yeah. to deal with the bulk of the tickets are going through your channels and the money's in your account yeah so it which helps means that then when you get an offer to go to america you're like oh fuck we haven't got three and a half grand for visas it's like well we have because we've done that in pre-sale yeah rather yeah. than some promoter just sitting on it yeah hey, exactly weeks, and then having to chase yeah. weeks after you've actually played the game and rolling in all these bullshit costs as well like 120 quid for towels and <laughs> yeah fucking whatever <laughs> it, yeah it, it just like looking at that there's, there's like you you haven't spent 2000 quid on promotion yeah because you didn't promote it <laughs> yeah you're not actually doing your job as a promoter promoters don't promote some yeah. do yeah, good ones do. But I mean, creating an event on Facebook is not promotion. No, and I like, <laughs> like, no, but like that's like we created an event and we invited some people, forty six friends down, and it's like, yeah, but you're you're taking like over fifty yeah. percent of the takings through Facebook event. You haven't even done any. You haven't even printed any posters, which is old school. I know people don't really print posters anymore. I think venue posters are still important, though. Yeah, venue posters, like flyering in towns and stuff. I mean, it can be useful, but I mean, when they do nothing and then just take, you look yeah. at the ticket sales. If go, they're okay. not spending, in my opinion, like there should be a budget for like four or five quid per head. 
Absolutely. On Facebook and Instagram, marketing spend. Uh, it's amazing that like they won't, and in, in in Europe as well. I don't. I just think they're like don't want to know any of that mm. at all. I mean, stuck in those like traditional. Ways. Yeah, they're like I'm the promoter in Hamburg, and I've put posters in all the music bars, and I've created a Facebook. Event. And, and that's the thing. I bet a lot of them do still do good numbers, but man, if they did like four or five quid per uh, yeah. head in like yeah, Instagram and Facebook spend, I would really, really missing love, a trick. I think oh, I'd love all of them to, to like on this tour we've got next year. If they all chucked in a cut of 100 euro which per venue is not yeah. a lot to get a few grand there to do like proper ads mm -hmm. the, the difference they would like collectively get across the across the whole run I just think it would be a massive step up to definitely get. man but I think to be honest that's something now we'll probably do make sure we re the, reach the the fans and then uh, just take it on the chin ourselves just mm. like, well for that again that's why you're going to have more and more artists like artists will become promoters as well as labels and agents and stuff because artists are wising up to this shit yeah and realizing like well like we can build this fan base through the paid ads ourselves we can book the venue we can sell the tickets on shopify um, and we know exactly how to market these shows to this mm. warm audience of people that we've built, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, targeting them, like, based on, like, the affinity artists, like, you know, so so in for us and you, it's like, say you're marketing a show in the UK um, or just a release, like a music video, we're going to go specials, bad manners, bad manners um, madness. Yeah selector do you know what i mean and pinpoint the detailed targeting on facebook lets you do that like mm. not every band big band comes up but loads do and you can you can literally search people on facebook and instagram that are actively interested in bands the big bands that that you know have inspired your sound and whatever do you know what i mean and you can reach those fan bases through these ads mm. so yeah, the the sort of more artists wise up to that, the more they'll they'll start becoming their own promoters as well as their own labels and yeah, and stuff. I, I would definitely say in your hometown as a band, if you're good for numbers, um, you know, just do your own gig. Don't don't get a local promoter in. Yeah, to take more unless they look. You've got to build building good relationships is a cool thing, right? in life so if a, if you're giving a promoter half of something but he's running a, a really great festival that you'd like to be a part of or he can grow you into bigger venues and stuff then that's that's a decent trade for me it's a yeah, good investment i for agree both yeah parties. but it's that sort of like the people that put in nothing and then just take half for fuck all that's the stuff where it's like and we've done two many london shows where we're pulling a few hundred people and we're giving our like fee away to a promoter who's not done any promotion mm -hmm. that's a it's, fucking sickener as well yeah right? it's, yeah, it's yeah. Feel like it feels like you've been in the boxing ring you've done a few rounds because you do feel beat, beaten up mm. Because you give it your all, you play your heart out, and then you, like you say, get the expenses. You're just like, how have we ended up? They've grossed that much, and how have we ended up with so little? So don't, don't do it. Book no. your own shows. I mean, you've got to be willing to take a risk, though, haven't you? That's a massive. Yeah, but I mean, if you know you're good for hundred people in your town, mm. whatever town, then it's not much of a risk. It's like a yeah, very calculated you... risk. Isn't yeah, it? you yeah. know what the venue cost, the hire is going to be. Um, then you just go ahead and book, book it and any extra money pile back into your promotion. Mm -hmm. just, just giving it to some other entity for doing nothing is sort of morally corrupt and, and also uh, exhaust, emotionally exhausting. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? In, it's, if you're going into other parts of the world, you, do, you have to rely on these people, I think, to a degree. The promoters, of course you do. And where you've been building good relationships, that's good to sort of nurture them, keep them going. But um, yeah, it's not a, a, not a very nice feeling when you're like playing local. Yeah, because ultimately, like the output, like 
that you've put into that show far outweighs what that promoter has. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, he's just nabbing a load of load of easy money. Mm. I mean, I'd put a deposit down on a venue if I knew someone was bringing a few hundred people and we went 50-50. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, one more thing I want to talk about on the marketing front. Mm. So we spoke about sort of activating mm. your pre-engaged followers yes. yeah. um, with retargeting ads. But what we haven't spoke about yet is you mentioned earlier that um, you sort of felt as though you'd neglected the UK mm. potential audience in the UK a bit. So we've been helping you rectify that with these free plus shipping album ads. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what, what we're doing there is we're targeting um, – Fans of the specials, Madness, all the two-time bands, bands we like, yeah. with a music video yeah. um, for Our Night Out, which was um, one of your first singles, wasn't yeah. it? We re, um, we, we made a new music video for it. Then yeah, we, we kind of modernised the it, aesthetic. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we've been targeting that music video to to those fans um to the fan bases of those bands online and then retargeting them with another ad that advertises a, a free signed cd copy of the album and um essentially what we're doing there is building like a, a monetized mailing list of people in the uk isn't it mm -hmm. so like roughly how many copies have we done so i think we started that promo about a year ago, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, I, th I think we're pushing like nearly a thousand, maybe mm -hmm. a thousand CDs have been sent out, which is good. good. Yeah, and do you think that had a knock-on effect to the underworld sales? I think it did, mm -hmm. and I definitely feel like the UK festivals we've played this year, there's a bit more um, awareness of us. Mm -hmm. So you know, when a festival's saying, "Who are you looking forward to this weekend?" You might get an occasional shout out from a fan that happens to be coming along or whatever, but there's been a lot of engagement pre festival of like we're looking and then afterwards as well. I mean, maybe it's a combination of I don't know, playing well as a band, but it, the, the sort of presence and engagement of um, you know, because we're I guess. Uh, at recruiting or actively seeking these fans that we think would like our music, they're sort of vocal, and it seems like we're more on the radar than yeah, we have more been of a before. Presence. More of a presence, yeah. And I'm not sure if that's something that um, I'm just sort of feeling, and whether that's accurate or not. But that's the vibe I'm getting, and uh, that's cool mm. because you want to be able to. Uh, you know, you want people to do your bidding for you. Definitely, mate. And I think what's exciting is when you guys go ahead and do the next album, should you choose to crowdfund that again, you're going to have over a thousand yeah. UK customers in there that we didn't have before yeah. when we hit that 25K overall. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it'll be interesting to see what that growth looks like you know come the yeah. next um crowdfunding campaign yeah. and then the self-promoted tour that we're planning on helping yeah, uh, you with the marketing year. Yeah. next year cool man so what has been the highlight of your music career oh god um there's so many <laughs> i think i think probably the first um Playing a house of fun weekend of a madness is pretty big for us because we're big madness fans. Playing uh, 10 shows at the O2 Indigo with Chaz and Dave was mega. Although at the time we didn't, we were, we were still quite young and didn't realize how lucky we were to be doing those gigs with Chaz and Dave, who were just absolute legends. Were they really nice blokes? Super duper. Mm. Chaz was a real gentleman and, and fellow sort of piano player so I really loved chatting with him and he gave me a lot of time uh so they're, they're really magic that yeah that we did t 10 shows 
I think, at the Indigo with them. But over each Christmas, they did like three and then another three. So over a period of years, three or four years, we did a load of shows with them. Uh, Madness. And then playing the first festival in America was good. Punk rock bowling in Las Vegas was great. Playing the Fillmore in San Francisco, the Mighty Boss Tones. So there's a few things that really stand out. I guess those sort of, the bits that tap into being a kid, your kids sort of when you're a teenager and learning to play, listening to Madness or the Mighty Boss Tones. Mm. And then when you actually get to share a stage with those people. Yeah. And that's, play like the Fillmore Theatre in San Francisco. Yeah, where it's iconic, isn't it? It's yeah. iconic. You're just like, fuck, you know. Or, or even like the Kentish Tower, Brixton Academy, the first time you play Brixton Academy. Yeah. You're like, fucking how many gigs have I seen here? Who, who was that with? That was the Fireball Tour, um, which was sort of a uh, an all-day thing that was at Brixton with less than Jake Goldfinger. So a load of American bands. Wicked. Um, and that story you told me about Dickie from the Boss Tones. Yeah. The Harrington jacket. Can you just tell that? Cause I think that's a weird yeah, story. Yeah, I think we were in um, Sacramento and we're, just, we're all tired and jet lagged and arriving at this venue and setting gear up or taking gear backstage and whatever and then our merch girl come running up and says well we've already sold a Harrington and I was like really because the doors weren't even open she said yeah that bloke over there just come over and bought one and tipped me really well <laughs> and I was like fucking hell that's Dickie Barrett it's a singer from the Boston's she's like oh she didn't know and uh yeah he was the first one in the queue, bought a Harrington, wore it the whole tour. What a fucking legend. He was a legend. Unfortunately, that tour for us got cut a little bit short. We only did about five dates with him. But he was a super geezer and uh, really supportive of new bands, and bringing, nurturing on, nurturing the talent. Um, yeah, that was that was great. And uh, yeah, we did, a, we did about five West Coast tour, uh, dates with them. That was... Uh, a nice thing to have done. I'm trying to think of any other. I think whenever you get invited to a, a, a festival that you've heard of as well, that's nice in Europe, like Punk Rock. You mentioned it early, Punk Rock Holidays in Slovenia. That's amazing. That looks incredible, day. man. Yeah. It must have been like, what, six, 7,000 people there? Yeah, and it's over five days. They do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. <clears> and it's in. And you were on the main stage, weren't you? Like, on in the, the main afternoon. stage before the. Dropkick Murphys and some other good bands, friends of ours, Rumjacks. And then, yeah, that was um, it's in the mountains, rivers, beautiful, punk rock, loads of nice people. Um, so just getting to play shows and share stages with bands you like, that's pretty good. Like the Slack, we got going to America with a band called The Slackers. Man, they, they those guys can play, they're so good. The fact that we sh shared a couple of stages with them this year, and the fact that they've invited us over to America this year is incredible. So there's lots of hi highlights, I think, to be honest. And what's been your biggest struggle as a musician? Oh, I don't know. There's so many, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, God. Right. Let's get the get the new batteries ready. This is going to be a long, long part. Oh, I think <clears throat> when you're tired and you're a bit fed up and beaten up, and you haven't got like a manager to call or a label just sort this out you know you've just i think the biggest thing for me is having a sort of lead the charge and everything yeah but that's the whole thing about yeah responsibility about being entrepreneurial and it, mm. if you want to be in control of it you've got to take control of it and that means the buck sort of stuff yeah i bet your phone goes 24 7 doesn't it it so does a lot there's related. a lot of groups of what's happening there's a lot of like you know this is this has changed now. This flight, I mean, like our flights to America have been changed about four or five <laughs> times. With British Airways is like pinging, 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 and you've got to communicate with everyone. I'd love just to be out to sort of be just the, the songwriter and sing. Delegate a bit. some stuff. Yeah, yeah just turn yeah. up and fucking play. Yeah. You don't have to worry about, <laughs> you know, where the, the, you know, the other band members are and like, yeah, is the backdrop <laughs> too big for the stage? Yes. And it's like, your backdrop's too big. Have you got another backdrop? Well, where's where's the st like where's our crew? And it's like, well, they've gone for a fag or something. Like, oh. We had that electric ballroom. Our, our first ever backdrop, we were buzzing. 
And Johnny and I weren't there at the time. We were down the road doing something in the Camden Dingwalls. Um, but yeah, my mate Rishi was kind of like helping manage the night. Sent me a video of the the banner going up for the first time, and like everyone's like buzzing their tits off. And uh, it was just like fucking. I don't even think it would have. I think it would have been too big for Wembley Arena. <laughs> <Just> the <laughs> word <guns>. death. Like, <laughs> that was all. Like yeah, that was all we could uh, yeah. manage. And um, yeah, we had to abandon it unfortunately, which was. Um, yeah, a bit of a kick in the balls. Note to self: have different size banners. <laughs> yeah, we've we've gone the other way. We started with a tiny little one on a bit of you know strip of horrible little plastic. It's thing. like a PVC, PVC sort of material, isn't it? Yeah, people's flashes used to bounce off it. No one could see the name of the band. And then a slightly bigger one. We've got about four or five different banners now, and the festival one comes out on big stages. But yeah, there's a, a lot of the time there's but there's all those like random like logistics tasks that you just, yeah, like no one would, I don't think many people unless like they're in bands themselves or whatever and get it would like know that you're two days before that gig in front of 6,000 yeah. people in Slovenia, you're yeah. like sending emails about yeah. like dimensions of backdrops and yeah. like just random fucking Making yeah, sure travel the, the, arrangements The tofu's in for the vegans, otherwise <laughs> they won't play. Like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, you get there, you walk out on stage, right, I'm going to fucking have this. I'm going to write up for it. And you look back and you realise someone's forgot to even get the banner out the back <laughs> yeah. of the van. And you're like, you've got one fucking job to do. Yeah. Is make sure that all these people know it's us. And like, yeah, sorry, I overlooked that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. All good though, mate. So you've managed to sustain a full-time career as a musician for a number of years now. Um, what would you say has been the secret to that? And what advice would you give an aspiring musician that's just starting out on their journey? <clears throat> you just got to be fucking thick. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. You can't do anything else. I mean, no, you've got to just keep, keep going. I mean, there's nothing else I've done that I want to do more. Mm. it's like you know I'm not bothered about trying to act or be famous and just it's just I've always played music and that's what I want to do so I think being so focused on that like almost hell bent on just making trying to make a living out of it made me do what we've had to do because I don't want to go out and of course I've we've talked about like the Depping gigs and session in session work and playing lucrative gigs for corporate events, doing covers and you know how many times? I think it was about the twentieth time someone asked if we could play Sex on Fire by the Kings of Leon. I was like, "Fuck this! I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing covers anymore." Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's but I do want to do music, so we went back and played the music I wanted to play in pubs, which was old fifties rock and roll and stuff, which. Actually, Chaz and Dave, that's exactly what they did. They did loads of covers in American, and, the, and Chaz is singing an American accent, and he just stopped one day and he went, I want to sing in my own accent and play songs on the piano and do your own thing. So be true to yourself and stay focused and just do it. Just fucking get out there and play at all costs, you know. Say yes to gigs and, um, yeah, and you've got to have a tough skin, but just keep going I mean there's nothing else I think you're the same because you've been at it you're like a not a road dog but you, you, you're you in the industry and been at it for years mm -hmm. sort of like and other people we mutually know that are still doing like Barry Dub Pistols and stuff it's like you sort of you either sort of do it and you just keep doing it <laughs> yeah you, it's or your you, life's work isn't it yeah I, there's no point I've gone I really have really wish I'd take that fucking job in that insurance firm hmm. and I could have I could have been on X amount a year and had a company car or I could have I wish yeah. I'd done that e even really good money even if you were offering me like like hundreds of thousands mm. of pounds to do something I don't want to do I'm like fuck off I'm not I don't time is finite and yeah. I want to do what I want to do even if it's a struggle mm -hmm. and I'll keep doing it I mean 
the fear, my biggest fear, fear of God is like having to go and do something fucking normal because it all implodes and they're like, I wake up tomorrow and everyone goes, actually, your band are really shit. We've never liked it. Fuck off. No one wants to book you. And then it's like, what am I going to do? A day job, a real job. Ooh, that's terrifying. I mm. feel my heart. Good, 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 good. So, this is all you've known for so many years. Yeah, and you know you're a passion-driven yeah. individual. Do you know uh, what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think that's sort of a running theme on this Life a Musician podcast. Like, yeah, every, every guest, I would say, has, has been a completely passion-driven yeah. individual. Do you know what I mean? Um, you, you're not in it to make money. But you have to be savvy and entrepreneurial if if you're going to survive. So it's yeah, like, of course, yeah. And then then it's like byproducts, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And then by the better you are at that, and the better you get at that, then you actually you take pressure off yourself because you have a bit more breathing space. Yeah. Which then creatively is what you want. And also, so it's it, like it's, you take huge pride in that, don't you? When you when you can earn a few quid from your original art, do you know what I mean? Yeah. More shows in that, like, and just doing it DIY as well, where you haven't had that big machine and network of people like really pushing it for you. I think you. sometimes you, sh you, sh you should try and take a bit more pride in it, but I find that hard personally because I'm always like looking at the next thing. But I, the good yeah. thing, my my long-suffering wife has like <laughs> been there from the pub days and she's like, she's occasionally at a festival. So just stop, look, look at this, enjoy it. Like, mm. Or I'm getting stressed because the American visa is not coming through. So it'll come through and don't forget to enjoy it. Yeah. So I'm like hell bent on organizing, you know, the next thing and staying focused and making sure we don't run out of that line of merch and vinyl blah, 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 and just sort of overseeing the whole thing. Mm. You do have to fucking stop and enjoy it. Yeah. But that's a a preset because I've been doing it for so long mm -hmm. that it's just in you to sort of go, boom, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And uh I don't know, yeah, you just it's hard balance to strike, but I don't want to do, there's nothing else I've wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of made my mind up for me. Awesome, mate. Well, I think that's the uh, perfect place to finish up. Yeah, man. Jet, you're a fucking legend, mate. Thanks so much Cheers, for your mate. time. No, thank you. Nice one, dude.